Hello and welcome to this uh, edition of a very personal interview with uh, none other than Dr. Malini Shankar. Dr. Shankar needs no uh, introduction in the maritime industry. Of course, uh, to me, I have known her almost as one of the most powerful women in, in shipping. And uh, so thank you for your time, Dr. Shankar. And uh, we are really grateful uh, to, you know, uh, so that for you to just give us some time so we can have a small discussion with you. Actually, I'm in touch with a lot of students and uh, I've already told them that I will be having this discussion and they have asked so many things. So I, hopefully some of the things I will be able to ask you here. Dr. Shankar, uh, as we all know, has been a former Director General of Shipping and uh, she has a PhD in Public Policy and Institutional Economics from IIT Madras. At present, uh, she is the Vice Chancellor of the Chennai-based Indian Maritime University and also she is the Chairperson of the National Shipping Board. Uh, we all know that the National Shipping Board is the top advisory agency to the government on shipping related matters. Uh, Dr. Shankar, uh, I just wanted to ask you and this will be for the benefit of uh, so many people uh, who wants to know this. Uh, how has the choice of this uh, IS uh, Indian Administrative Service, you coming into this uh, this uh, domain, is that was that a decision, career decision? Were you passionate about this, or was this the result of something from your past experiences? Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Shokat, and it's a pleasure to be in a conversation with you uh, regarding the IAS. I think the first time I remember getting interested in the service was in class ten. Oh. And yes, uh, as early as that, because I saw one of my classmates father working as an IS officer and I was very intrigued by it. Um, and then I veered off that for a few years because I was an excellent student and uh, parental guidance said that I should specialize in science. I should uh, go on to the science stream rather than the art stream. And I kept getting a lot of scholarships to study higher studies, including a scholarship to go abroad and study. But at some point, I said I have to return back to what I really liked in my high school, give it a shot. And so I took a leave of absence from the US, where I was doing my PhD in chemistry, actually. And wow. <laughs> <laughs> came back and uh, never looked back at it because I got into the IS and civil service in the first attempt. And um, don't regret it. That's the best part. Of course, and we are so proud that uh, you, you actually did take that decision. It was for the benefit of us. Yeah, yeah it's uh, the biggest uh, decision I had to take in life, you know, at a time when everybody was actually heading abroad. I yes. said, no, I think I enjoyed studying there, but uh, my calling is in India and I came back. Fantastic. But, uh, you know, ma'am, when I was going through the, uh, I was going through the data there in, in the internet, and it says that, you know, uh, in India, of course, that uh, we have one lady IS officer among 20 male officers. I don't know, I don't, uh, cannot guarantee this data, but uh, is this a diversity ratio uh, proper or uh, did you actually, were you one of the first ones to be in IS or something? No, like not that? at all, not at all. The first lady was Anna Malotra, dating yes, back I know to the 1950s, who actually helped set up the JNP. Everybody yes. knows that. Yes. So it goes back very many long years and the government is actually an equal opportunity employer. It Absolutely. just depends on how many people who apply and how to them, how many get in. So it's a choice that is given. There is absolutely no gender bias in selection of the candidates at the level of uh, the UPSC, which is the agency for selecting the IOS, uh, you know, all civil servants. Um, I do not think it is one in 20. I think it's closer to about 12 to 13 percent. Okay. Yeah, uh, which is still not as good, but it's not as bad as five percent. Uh, there have been batches, for example, I think it was a 1994 batch which had 25 percent women. So it shows that you know there are there, there is no bias; it's just the number of people who are applying. For example, if you look at the foreign service, India has one of the best male-female ratios yes. in favor of women. If you look at the pilots, the airline pilots. We have the highest percentage in the I world. just, I, we just did a program last week on, on pilots and we were told that we are the, India is the most, I mean, they are the highest most. Percentage. It's about 19% against a global average of 12%. And that 12% is 
probably lifted up by the 19% of India. That's very and inspiring. In fact, yes. uh, when there was pilots training, when the, when the airlines and the skies opened up, I remember there was a story of a mother and a daughter going in for pilot training together to join the airlines. So wow. I think it just depends on the interests of the people. Yes, absolutely. So now, ma'am, now you are, of course, holding very two, two very important roles now as uh, the Chancellor, Vice Chancellor of IMU, as well as the Chairperson of the National Shipping Board. Now, I would like to just ask you, how are these roles diverse from each other and in terms of policy making? Is there any, any, any uh, kind of um, similarity in the policy making decisions that you are under these roles? They're very different. Primarily, it is the Ministry of Shipping and its officers which are responsible for both policy making as well as programs and their implementation. The National Shipping Board has, finds a place in the Merchant Shipping Act itself as a prime advisory body. So in terms of advisory body, it can take up uh, matters which are not being dealt with by the shipping ministry, basically to give an outside world view, to bird's eye view, to look at the thinking out of the box, complement the policy making, and it's not the prime policy making authority. As an advisory body, it gives suggestions. For example, the, uh, when the National Shipping Board was reconstituted in April 2020, um, the subjects taken up in consultation with the Honorable Minister were included, you know, what are the recommendations for the national shipping, national shipping, uh, merchant shipping bill, which was introduced in 2016, uh, the Indian uh, Ports Act with bill, which is being introduced. Uh, is there something, are there gaps that have been left out? Is there, you know, so there are experts in the shipping board and there are, we consult other people also, we co-opt other people as invitees. So it's something that the shipping ministry has not thought about or the various agencies have not thought about. So that's one part. In addition to that, we were looking at the multi, you know, multimodal transportation. How do you improve that? How do you promote coastal uh, uh, shipping and inland water shipping? Um, how do we, you know, what are the seafarers welfare programs that we can specifically recommend? And as I mentioned, these are all uh, inputs into policy making but they are complementary and supplementary to the main policy making which is done by the Ministry of Shipping and its adjunct officers. As far as the IMU is concerned, it's totally a different body. The National Shipping Board has the breadth. It can be as broad as the government allows it to be. Um, in the IMU is focused on just one vertical of the entire thing, which is training and education of the seafarers. So in that sense, it is not a policy making body. It can make, suggest policies with respect to training, uh, research, and education. So it's got the depth of to go deeper and deeper into uh, seafarers sea training, potential seafarers training, continuing training, etc. Um, so it, yeah, two very two different roles. But as I, it, the larger umbrella, it comes under the larger umbrella of promoting Indian shipping and promoting. Uh, participation of Indian seafarers in the global market. Absolutely, and uh, right, rightly you said, I think uh, government is also investing a lot of money in the Andamans now and uh, yeah. in the coming up uh, as, as the port. And so that is, that is very inspiring for all of us because we already feel that uh, we, we need to increase a lot of tonnage. And the more the tonnage increases, the more yeah. the seafarers' jobs will be increased. Right, ma'am. So it brings me to another uh, question, which is pertinent to the uh, to the present uh, situation that we are all facing with the pandemic and with the institutes closing down. You see, I speak to a lot of uh, these very young students who are there, and for them, there is a lot of uncertainty, which is in uh, which is uh, prevalent right now with with institutes closed down. So, what do you think, ma'am? And and this is I'm I'm just saying on behalf of them. What do you think is is the way ahead uh, for the training of the present batch and the present. So will they be able to make up this training in future? This pandemic, I think all of us understand that this is unprecedented. Absolutely. Leading to a situation which is, uh, you know, not predictable. It's quite unpredictable. And it's Absolutely. like, you know, somebody said we are all sailing in the same boat and somebody else corrected saying, no, we are all um, sailing in the same storm, but in different boats. <laughs> I, I think yes. that is a very precise definition of what we are facing. Um, so different sections of society, I think this pandemic has affected every family in some way or the other. And some people have taken advantage, like uh, while in the conversation that we had, you said you had actually added to your uh, 
you know, skills during the pandemic. Absolutely. And there are many people who have done that. So I think we have to look at how we can utilize the time during this pandemic, either taking a step back and relaxing and saying, you know, get out of the rat race for a little while. This is the message that's coming in and look at personal development, look at your personality development, look at reading, look at expanding your horizon, look at uh, widening your perspectives, etc. But that's on the individual front. On the professional front, and especially for the students, yes, it's very, very disturbing. And they're not mature enough to have seen a lot of their life to say yes. that uh, this too shall pass. They yes, are absolutely. In the time of life, and it's very frustrating for them to see that for no fault of them, for no fault of theirs, absolutely. something you know is held up and there's no predictability to it. But all I can share is it's simply unpredictable. Even the models, the simulation models that were coming out, uh, I was listening to a talk which said that yes, this will subside by May, it never subsided. They said it will subside by July, it never subsided. And where it subsided, there is a second wave already, whether it's Singapore, whether it is yes. um, Spain. Where Hong Kong, yes. yes. Yes, there is a second wave coming. So I think we need to be a little more patient. And if virus is teaching something very specific, it is be patient. I mean, you are not the masters of the universe. There is something called Mother Nature and everything behind it that's the masters of the universe. So I think every single sector, section of society, every single organization and entity is trying to deal with it, come to terms with it and see what best can be done. And so is the IMU, so is the UGC, so are hundreds of other colleges and universities. Absolutely. So I think, for example, the UGC has said that all exams have to be conducted by the end of September. And institutions are struggling to see how it can be conducted because the UGC has already also said that it has to be online proctored. Yes. Now that's something we have not tried. Online yes, scampering. The people are all yeah, scampering. Yes. It is, it is, because you know it is not a tested technology. Uh, you can only do pilot runs and hope that they will succeed. Um uh, and it, how what a type is, is it? How will it ensure that it's the same as being proctored in person, being supervised in person is a big question mark in the minds of everybody. So I think there is, we are working on it. The IMU is working for the final exams on the online proctored exams. The difficulty we face is in conducting practical exams, in conducting the, you know, in ensuring that the students, the cadets, have their minimum uh, number of hours that they have yes. to have in, you know, they have to clock training, yes. practical training. Yeah. And the students most affected are the ones who have not been uh, able to get access to onboard training. Because if they get access to onboard training, they can get off, take the practical exam and move on. So we are working out modalities in consultation with the DG shipping and we're looking at other universities and the technologies to see how the theory exams can be conducted. We have a plan to do them in December. Uh, sorry, September. September. Uh, this is for the final year. As for the okay. intermediary years, we still have time to think about it. We have, we are taking decisions. It's a work in progress and it will be done. Um, but I, I do think, uh, if I may venture to say that at the risk of, uh, you know, being pounced upon by various sections of society, I, I, I think learning is a continuous process. Yes. Uh, our focus on just exams and marks have to take a step back. They are important, but they are not all important. They are not the only thing. And I, I'm actually trying to see whether we can do, get the students instead of taking exams, can they do projects, can they do, can they do, uh, participate in workshops and you know, give a write up on the workshops, can they give original papers, but then how do we make sure they're original, how do we, basically what I would like to see is, um, uh, you know, critical thinking, critical analysis capabilities, which does not come through just paper exams or online exams. But, the assurance that I can give the students, and I get a lot of emails directly from the students, which is um, which is both a pain as well as uh, you know a feedback. Uh, they, I can see how disturbed they are, and my empathies are with them. But I assure that we are doing our very very best to ensure that the students' life is not uh, you know disturbed that their natural progress towards taking exams, graduating and going on to a job or higher studies is not disturbed. But at the same time, I would like to emphasize that we live in very um, unprecedented times and uh, it requires tough solutions which we are coming up with. 
I am sure what you're saying right now is going to be a great inspiration for all the students. Uh, like I said, I, I'm in touch with a lot of students and one of the things that I want to know, ma'am, and what, what you're saying, telling me is very evident that a lot of thought is being put into these matters right now and a lot of research is going in. And uh, I, I wanted to ask you that this, with this pandemic and with this kind of lockdown phase where everybody's working from closed doors, it gives rise to a lot of good opportunities also that people are evolving and we are into this digital platform in five months down the line, nobody knew about uh, video <laughs> conferencing, you know, but yeah. so will this, uh, will this be a level of opportunity even for IMU to maybe reshape the education levels and go into more blended learning where more online classes will be done in future? I think pandemic or no pandemic, we need to continuously evolve teaching and learning methodologies. Absolutely. It cannot be the same that existed 30 years ago in my generation. And, and even that probably was a change from what existed 30 years earlier, you know. So, uh, yes, blended learning, some, some of the colleges are doing it, doing a wonderful job of that. I don't think uh, pandemic or no pandemic, these new methodologies like blended learning, animation, we are getting a lot of inputs that's available freely on the website as well as customized uh, yes, you know, packages yes. for animated learning because you, you know, it, the simulations, you know, you have, first you had simulators which occupied a room and then, you know, it just, uh, it was just basic. Exactly. And now you have 3D simulators where you walk in and you actually feel that you are in the ship and you are sailing. Yeah, it's like virtual reality. Yeah, yeah virtual, virtual reality because we are 3D simulators. So we will head towards that because not everybody can get onto a ship and how do they, you know. But having said all this, there is, in my opinion and the opinions of experts in the education field, there is simply no alternative to face-to-face -face learning. It cannot be while you, it can be complementary and it can add value, it, it, you know, there is more than, if you, if you want to learn a skill on your own, self-motivated, maybe online learning is very good. You know, you sign up for a class and you say, I am motivated and I want to do this. But I think the basic education is not just about learning, you know, um, just learning lessons and passing exams. It's about interaction, it's about playing sports, it's about taking winning and losing economously. It's about a little bit of competition, which prepares exactly. you for the real world. It's about peer learning. It's about faculty interaction. You will find at least a certain percentage of the faculty will be inspiring, motivating and mentoring. So I don't think this can be uh, replaced. Let me just ask one thing of everybody who's listening. If it can be replaced, then why, do we, why are we waiting for the world to open up? It can be done, yes, absolutely. Yeah, you're at home, you have access to everything, at least the digital divide is a problem, but those who have the digital access, they have everything in the world. So why would they want to go out? Absolutely. So I don't think there is a, uh, there is a substitute for um, having a classroom and uh, you know having a lab, learning things. And uh, which you rightly said this, uh, one more thing comes back to me all the time is uh, that, uh, and what you rightly said about VR simulators and 3D simulators. And in future, ma'am, you know, the kind of education if we have right now in the maritime as well as non-maritime is more about textbooks, more about, in fact, I was, uh, at some point of time, I was talking to one of the principals of the institute. They say that we absolutely have very less time on our hands because the syllabus is so extreme. So. Uh, when I talk to students again, they say that we, they, they, need, they would probably prefer much more of practical learning and practical training. Is there any plans for IMU or maybe the DG or maybe uh, the National Shipping Board also or the Shipping Ministry to come out with more training ships in the future so that people can be sent and you know, practical trainings be given to them? That's going to be entirely a cost factor. Yes, it is. You know, the time to time. The government has thought of having training ships and the costs simply did not work out, even for the private sector, so forget for the government sector. That's one aspect when, you know, if we were making, if, made, if Indian made ships were much uh, cheaper, then maybe it would work out. But at the moment, I think the whole thing hangs on the cost factor. Now, the syllabus, yes, we can, you know, the IMU will definitely look, um, I think it's uh, now time to review the syllabus and see how practical it is and how feasible it is to impart so much knowledge. But again, I would like to emphasize one more thing. Um, are we looking at quantity and not quality? 
are we like are we looking at the quantity of marks rather than the quality of uh, learning um i think what is missing in our entire education system in the country is conceptual learning yes yes you yes. understand the uh, you understand the concepts your practical will be much easier one is conceptual learning you know do i understand the concept 360 degree of any issue or am i learning it just from this angle to pass that exam because that's the question which comes most often in the exam once you understand 360 degrees you are a master and you'll get higher left right and center second is your analytical capability of analytical critical thinking and critical analysis if you master these two then no amount of theory and no amount of practicals is impossible i hear students i get feedback saying we don't have practical training but then if you see on the other side they say their theory is so weak that they are not yes. able to put it into practice so there has to be a lot of balance between theory there has to be a balance i think what has happened in modern world is everything is uh, you know skill oriented rather than knowledge oriented i just want the skill i want to be able to do it and then go on and you know but you you look at the lowest level in the shipping industry also in a ship the oiler and the mechanic probably know more than the engineer it's just that they can't go up because because they're willing to dirty their hands they will there is there is a there is a mechanism in force where they can come up with the sea time and they can give an exam yes but they are willing you know uh, i'll give you a parallel when i was working in the special economic zone there were the full of you know there was a it boom at that time we're talking about circa 2080 so i remember one of the top it firms saying that we would rather hire um people from the polytechnics than from the engineering colleges yes. because one they accept that there is more to learn than what they know and two they are willing to dirty their hands and actually get on it whereas the engineering graduate says i know everything now you pay me i've got my degree so i i think there is an attitude difference and that attitude has to be bridged and the generations to come have to be aware of what i mean they have to be sensitive to what the industry wants what the employer wants i was talking to a foreign ship owner the other day and uh, he was telling me indians have started behaving like more like europeans than europeans do themselves which is when they will start losing the jobs and that is that is a so the europeans is, have lost the jobs because yes, of yes and that that again is a plague that is uh, plaguing all of our indians right now that if we start losing jobs then we are nowhere in the market no then you are finished then we so, are finished so based on the feedback that i have had continuously ever since i stepped into the shoes of uh, dd shipping two things about the indian workforce and the seafaring community one is um needs improve and i'm just quoting the employers and quoting the industry i am not speaking from you know it's not a personal opinion so please bear with me and do not get annoyed with me uh, one is there could be tremendous improvement in attitudes and very often they compare it with compare the attitudes of indian seafarers with the filipino seafarers with the vietnamese seafarers who come with an attitude which is more open saying i'm willing to try all this and if i am hired for job a i'm willing to try job b and see if there is a problem that is uh, one and the second is uh, compared to 20 years ago uh, the communication skills of the indian seafarers has weakened so we is need it? to yes we need to build on both and when we say communication it is not mastery over the queen's english we are not talking about english grammar and composition that's just the language yeah and martin that's just a medium but the ability to communicate includes the ability to listen to learn and to respond to the point to be able to argue cogently to have clarity of thought and expression so these are things which don't which can't be taught in a classroom which have to come from parents which have to come from neighborhood which has to come from the college of course but also has to come from within to see how we can improve ourselves and who we benchmark ourselves against so so this is a very interesting point that you've said in fact uh, very few people have heard talk about this that the communication skills are going down is this a influx of maybe social media on people because it's they have lost their kind of uh, sense of uh, uh, patience maybe it could be a plethora of things and i'm sure the the people the professionals in the cognitive sciences are doing multiple research on this 
but it, it, it feeds in from many things. It feeds in from has the child had an opportunity to, you know, to, uh, to actually communicate better, you know, Com coming from uh, certain um, backgrounds, from interior areas or from government schools, which have not stressed the importance of communication, but learning by rote. So it starts there. Do they come from families which are able to communicate well? So do they live in an ecosystem where communication has been effective? Because I think 20, 30 years ago, from what I see, when I meet people from that generation, the seafarers, they came from urban families, German families. They came from convent-educated background. They wanted to see the world. They opted to be there, not for the money, but for saying, I love the seas and this is a family tradition or I want to explore the world and they learned and and they did what it took but uh, right now it's become just another profession and rightly so i mean there are other options they have but i would say that you know my my mantra for any child any student you know who's come to me is go for something you love don't take it because somebody told you whether it is parent peer teacher neighbor you go because you love it. And if you don't love it, just move on to something you love. Because when you take up something you really like and you're passionate about, you cannot fail. People will notice you. So either you do that or if you were not in a position to do that, yeah, not all of us are lucky or fortunate enough to find something we really love, then learn to love what you've taken up. <laughs> That's again a very good skill that they need to develop. How to learn to... Uh, try and love what you've taken up, yes. Otherwise, you will, you know, you'll end up always, uh, you know, having a nagging feeling in the mind saying, I'm not happy. You will end up as a happy person, yes. Yeah, you, you, and you won't be able to express to people, I'm un unhappy. So it will get reflected in the inefficiencies at work, perhaps, or even in relationships. Yes, absolutely. And in fact, ma'am, uh, now the age of social media is so prevalent in everybody's lives. And especially the new generation is uh, there on Instagram and they're on Facebook. And there are thousands and thousands of people all in different kinds of groups. And a lot of information going on in the social media. And uh, so, so I monitor social media very closely and we are very strong on the media and to stay in touch with the... So we see a lot of, uh, you know, agencies trying to take, uh, take advantage of these students, of these seafarers there on the social media at this present moment. So I would want to ask whether if IMU has a representation or maybe it will be possible to have, I mean, not, not like a police eye or something like that, but then if they can have a representation on social media so they can directly interact with the students, I think this is a great opportunity that uh, of interaction which can be developed. Um, the first instance, we are not even there if I say on the traditional media. <laughs> So we've taken baby steps. We we put out a video, um, uh, you know, considering it's the admission uh, season. We put out a video which was shown before and after the prime minister's speech on the Independence Day, and I I I don't know how many people saw it. Okay, we have now um, you know remitted it. We've sent it to 1,200 schools which are on our list, basically the central schools, the Kendriya Vidyalaya. So we take our baby steps there. I think if social media, yes, everybody has to go on to it at, that, at some point. But if you notice, there are two things about social media. One is there is an information overkill. Yes. It's Agreed. just you don't know where you are, what you're looking for. It's, it's, it's and very it's, yeah. And very transitory, very transitory. I mean, what is the, if you take a survey on how many, uh, how much time people spend on any particular point, it will be nanoseconds at this point of time perhaps. Yes, exactly. And that is the reason why I said uh, in the earlier question, you said that people are losing communication skills, maybe because they have very less uh, dwell time on particular thing. Okay. Now coming back to that, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if your viewers and uh, listeners are interested in it, I read a professional article on cognitive science once saying yes. that, you know, looking at the, um, the, uh, the time that people can spend just on any one thing. And they related it to the development of traditional media also. So they said there was a time 30 years ago, 
in India, especially, you look at it, we had only one channel, Dhoot Darshan, and like it or not, you have to watch it. <laughs> and every Sunday evening, there would be three hours film. Either you went cycling during that, like me, or you sat and watched it with the family, right? Yes. But you would watch a film for three hours non-stop. Now, when there were multiple channels, you started zapping. Okay? Yeah, it's and like you, you, you just channel hopping, yes. Everything. So what has happened is they've related it to the attention span of a child in the cognitive research. They said that when you had that one channel, your mind was tuned to looking at something for three hours, whether it's TV or on a rainy day eating pakoras and reading a novel for three hours. I'm going, to, I'm going to write an article on this now. You have inspired me. This is extremely interesting. Yes. So non-stop. Non-stop. You could read a novel if it's interesting unless it was a bad novel. Okay. And then... Um, you know, when it came to multiple channels, but you could not zap, the remote was not there, but you had to get up, go and turn the channel queue. Then people went to reading two books, you know, reading a newspaper, but this attention span was still there. It may not be three hours, but it could be 20 minutes, it could be one hour. With the zapping, the remote and the social media, they say it's come down to 20 seconds, two minutes, just two minutes. So the challenge posed to the educator is, how do you transmit this knowledge, tome of knowledge that you've got to transmit, call it syllabus, call it curriculum, call it lesson. How do you transmit it within that attention span of two minutes? It's a near impossibility. So perhaps, yes, the teaching and learning methodologies have to evolve and move into more interactive mode so that you, know, the, the, you engage and you involve the student and the teacher also remains engaged. And for that, the bigger challenge more than the student is the teacher who's not trained for that. <laughs> yes. So, you know, yes. you, it's at multiple levels that you have to get into this. So, yes, social media has had a tremendous influence at even the thinking behavior of a human being. There is an information overkill. And then other thing is social media is, can be very nasty from what I see. Yes, it can Very be. Very nasty. It's so ruthless. You, want, to, 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 you know, to what purpose is the point. So if you want to engage, it has to have a purpose. I can, yes, I can use the social media to put something through, but there's an information overkill, there's an attention span deficiency. But if I am going to just get the brickbats, I don't see the point. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's not, it has to be mutually engaging that both learn and social media is not that today. No, it is not. You're right. I agree. It is, it is rootless and the amount of trolling that happens, I mean, it's better that to stay away from this, all, all, all that negativity. Yes. 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 So uh, we come to our, uh, our penultimate uh, session and that is a very, very interesting session, which marks the hallmark of our interview. And uh, it's called the rapid fire round. It is just okay. more for us to go and get inside your mind. So, because I, I am personally a big fan of you, ma'am, and uh, oh, I've <laughs> interacted you. with you over the years, and I, with your acumen and with your with your intelligence, I'm, I I find it, it's it's a true inspiration that you that you are, I mean, lot of lot of women, not only women, lot of students, lot of uh, people like us will highly experienced, highly inspired uh, by you, you know. So if we can even get one person of what is going around in your mind most of the time. So, so this is just a, a few questions, very fast, rapid fire questions and just very short answers. Uh, what is Dr. Malini Shankar's greatest strength? Uh, I think it's for others to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. I, I think I've retained the child in me. Okay. You retain the child in you, of course. And, and as we all know, children have special skills. Some of them have, you know, creative thinking and... So that's, that's, I know from where you're coming from. Okay. So next question is your advice to women in the maritime industry. There's a lot of, lot of talk already with women in the maritime industry. What's your one line advice to them? Continue to be passionate about it. Absolutely. So continue your passion in the industry. If you were given a chance to change any, something uh, in your past, something at all in your past, if you're given a chance to change, what would that be? I'll try to, you know, reduce my short temper. <laughs> <laughs> and that, bring, that brings me to my next question. In fact, you've just taken it out of my mouth. What do you do when you're really angry? <laughs> scream. <laughs> you scream. Okay. Okay. So if you were to write your autobiography, 
what name would you choose for that? Uh, oh God, this is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I'm good at choosing names, but not uh, in a split second. <laughs> no, I mean, whatever comes into your mind. If you were to choose something about, you're writing a book on yourself, and you choose, you have to choose a name. Would it be just maybe just Malini, or maybe just? No, 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 no it won't be no. just Malini. No, no. That wouldn't be. So maybe you can think it over and maybe it will, I'll uh, ask you later if, you, if it's not coming to you. Autobiography of a common man. <laughs> autobiography of a common man. Common but woman. <laughs> yeah, but inspired by R.K. Lakshmi. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Okay, in your career, uh, ma'am, uh, in your career span, what has given you the maximum satisfaction? I'm sure there are lots of things. But if you look back, uh, what has given you uh, immense satisfaction? You know, when there is somebody who comes and tells you, you did this for me and because of that, I benefited in my life. Wow. So, so that's, that's a great thing. And that's something you did unknowingly. And not, not expecting anything in return. And, and ma'am, see, I, I wanted to ask you personally one thing. And uh, this is just because, you know, you've been the epitome of success. And you seem happy and you seem content and you're doing extraordinary service to the nation as well as to your profession. What do you think takes for uh, for a person to be successful? I know there are a lot of challenges in uh, all the time in everybody's path, but what are two or three criteria that you can advise people for success? I think like I told you, passion for what you're taking up. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, focus. Focus on what you want to do. Uh, and... Um, I think a dollop of goodwill from people. Hmm. But that 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 you have to develop, I think, in the uh, in the. Yeah, but don't around, forget yeah. that. I said that because you don't forget that. Yeah, it's, it's it's you're saying it's very it's great to remember all the time. We should remember that. Yeah. yeah so you you reach out to people, then you know you do things for people. You know, like like they say that uh, those who the you know what you give you get back. So you've got to remember that. Absolutely. Karma. Yeah. So I'm not giving you the try yeah, yeah. what yeah. everybody says about hard work and dream and aim high. I think people have succeeded without aiming and aiming high also. <laughs> Occasionally you will tell people saying I'm here by chance. Mm. Okay. Uh, but yeah, don't be afraid to take decisions. When I say passion, I'm speaking from example because I was doing very well in my PhD in the United States. But I said, no, I need to go back and that's my calling. And I took a decision against everybody's wishes. I said, this is where I want to be. I came back and worked for it. So I'm speaking from my personal example also. Hard work, there is no substitute for hard work, but that everybody will tell you. There is no substitute for hard work. But a focus, attention, and people don't forget that we are, we live on earth and uh, everything that we do should ultimately benefit the living things on earth, whether it's human beings or whether it is animals, whether it's plants. Because I remember Dr. Abdul Kalam, our ex-president, once said, scientific research, the success of scientific research is not introducing something that nobody can use, but introducing something that benefits humankind. Absolutely. And I think that's a very, very po positive and strong statement. And Absolutely. any field, even economics, and if you don't think of the common man who will benefit, then there is no point in doing your research or hard work. So, so this is something which, you know, I, when I... Uh, and again, I, just one thing, success is, you know, success can be defined in very different ways. Absolutely. I mean, some people might say, I want to have a $5 million house and that's my success. So you have to define it. And he might not be wrong there. I mean, it might, might be his be definition. Wrong, but then it's for oneself. You have to define it for yes. yourself. You have to yes. live with your own desires and your own strengths. Understanding your strengths and weaknesses is something that is, is very uh, contributory to success. You know, so, um, and as a youngster, you will say, yes, I want to get this degree. I want to become the CEO. This is very, very common. I want to become the CEO of a company. I want to become a successful startup. I, I want to, you know, build this house by the sea. Yes, but as you grow older, your definition of success changes. Changes. Modifies. It modifies. You say, yeah, because priorities change. Priorities change and also what gives you satisfaction. Okay, I've, I've, I've got everything. So am I happy? That's something you have to ask yourself. 
and that level of uh, happiness is also very different for different people there are people who uh, you know who chucked up uh, jobs abroad or uh, high level corporate jobs and gone to work in the villages and they are very happy there so ask them what is their uh, you know what is their calling success. yes yeah what is their definition of success it will be different so there let there not be one definition of success but as a youngster you have every right to say it is money and foreign travel and you know resort by the sea etc but as you go along you have to be open to the fact that you know what brings you inner happiness is basically family people around you what you contribute to the people i i i think i've reached that stage <laughs> <laughs> you've reached the stage passing a lot of many other stages of course oh yeah so that's why i'm saying Yes. Um, it, it depends on. Of course, when I was a bureaucrat, uh, serving bureaucrat, I I wanted good posts. That was my idea of success. I look back at it and I said, it's. I say it's very silly because you can contribute and you should have the confidence to say you can contribute in any post. Can, That's a great statement. Yes. That's yeah. This is something that I realized halfway through the career. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe sixty percent into my career, I said, yeah. I mean, I. there's no point in hankering because every single success has its own downside so you have to see you have to keep this balance uh i think this is i'm very confident by that time i was confident saying like give me a post and i'll show you the contribution so for example for my personal professional life um most people in the is say they contributed the maximum when they were district magistrate and collector of any district and that was not my case so i may have been an outlier i may have been maverick but my contribution came in very different field so each one my strength was obviously in contributing somewhere else not as collector so don't fall into that rut i would tell a student don't fall into a rut at all define it for yourself fantastic fantastic uh, opinions and fantastic sharing this uh, with you and one last question ma'am and uh, what is your definition of god i mean of course each and everybody's definition is different just like success you said what what does god mean to you yeah the closest i come to him and see him or her is nature if you go back to our ancient civilization the vedas never had gods yes I they worship vayu they worship indra they worship rudra which are all forces of nature what inspires me is nature and uh the closest you can come to on earth to god is somebody who in very trying circumstances helps others that's 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 amazing in fact uh, it, it's uh, i am a follower of vivekananda also and in fact vivekananda said the same thing he says uh, help others and uh, you you will help yourself so uh, to our to all our viewers who have been listening in and uh, Uh, we were in discussion and talks with Dr. Malini Shankar, one of the most powerful ladies uh, in the shipping, and, uh, very kind and, the and rightly so. And a little bit of discussion of what goes around in her mind most of the time, and she has given us invaluable lessons today, and which I am going to share with all our students. Ma'am, we can't thank you enough, and uh, we really, really uh, am grateful to you for spending time with us. And this is going to be a very, very useful session for basically the students who. who have been looking up uh, to me to ask these questions and also to all the industry uh, one last word that you want to tell all the students of the maritime who are great expectations from this industry to build their careers for success earning dollars going out so what is your advice uh, to all these who are really coming up and yes. climbing the ladder now for the moment my advice is stay safe and stay healthy don't take chances with this uh, virus and uh, looking forward um keep courage work hard and the it can only look up the life can only look up fantastic so with that note uh, we would like to end this session and uh, thank you ma'am thank you for for your mm -hmm. time and thank you for all that you've said it's a great learning experience for